Hi, second graders. Welcome back to your TV classroom. Today is Tuesday, February 2nd. How are you today? Let's check in with our feelings. What zone do you feel like you are in right now? Yeah, Mr. Kevin. <laughs> Mr. Kevin's in our red zone. I am having a really interesting day, friends. It's one of those days where everything is just not going quite right. I'm finding lots of mistakes. I'm saying the wrong things. But you know what? We're having a really good time at the TV classroom and we're laughing about it because it's been so funny. So if I make mistakes today, I apologize. I'm trying my best to be really focused and I am in the green zone, but my brain is just kind of not focusing with me. So I'm gonna do my best to focus as best as I can and let's get going with our day. I remembered, you know what I remembered? I remembered to put pictures of Oliver. So this is Oliver. He is almost two. He's going to be two on the 21st. And on the picture on the left, he was out with his nanny at the park playing. And on the right is a picture of him in his daddy's work boots. They were back by the back door and we were cooking dinner and he decided to put them on and walk around the house in them. And it was very funny. And then the picture on the bottom is him in his new hat that matches his daddy's hat. So that's Oliver. So when I talk about Oliver, that's who I'm talking about. Yes, Mr. Kevin? I was just going to say, I wonder if any of our second graders remember when they were two. I wonder. Hmm. Yeah. If you do, maybe you could write us and send it to us here at the TV classroom about your memory. We would love to hear about it. All right. So that's Oliver. So now you know what he looks like. Let's get on with True or False Tuesday. Here we go, Mr. Kevin, are you ready to play? I'm ready. Okay, so 12 minus four equals eight. True or false? True. It does. 19 minus four equals six. True or false? False. Do you know how I knew that was false right away? Because I know six and four make 10. So 19 minus four is not going to be six. It would need to be 20 minus four to be not even six. It would be 16. That's not even close because four and six is 10 and that's nine more than, that is very wrong. It should be 19 minus four equals 15. Someone it's definitely made a mistake. What you would call super false. Super false, yes. <laughs> super false. Okay, next one. 23 minus 4 equals 19. True or false? True. It is. If you have 23 and you take 3 away, you get to 20, and take 1 more, you get to 19. Did it go? No. It did not. It's just one of those days. 26 minus 4 equals 21. True or false? False. I know that 6 minus 4 is 2. So that's going to be 22, not 21. 35 minus 4 equals 31. True or false? True. It's correct. All right. Today we are learning to compare three digit numbers. We're still working on this. So here we go. Before we begin, we're going to practice what we practiced yesterday. Again, because it's important, writing the value of each digit in the number. So, 459, how many hundreds are in 459? Yeah, four hundreds. If you wanna write this down on your whiteboard, I would suggest doing that, it helps you learn it, or you could write it in expanded form. 
So we've done the four. What about the five? We've got the five right here. What is that worth? Yeah, 50. So how many tens is 50? Five, there's five tens. Five tens. And how many ones? Nine. Great. Now, 456. How many hundreds? Four. How many tens? Five. Wait a minute. Both of these numbers have the same amount of hundreds and the same amount of tens. So I think we're probably going to have to compare the ones place today. How many ones are in the number 456? Six ones. Which number is greater? 459. Why is it greater? It has more ones. Very good. These two paintings are in the school art contest. Oh, that'd be so fun, Mr. Kevin, to do an art contest with Miss Teresa. Oh, that would be cool. Like hang art here at the Central Administration Building? Mm -hmm. <gasps> that would be really fun. Okay, back to math. Which painting has more votes? So go ahead and get your whiteboard out. First of all, we need to know what the votes are. So how many votes does painting A have? 467. So Mr. Kevin, we can go ahead and see. Actually, I want them to solve this on their own. So we're going to just have that up. I want you to solve this on your own. I want you to see how long it takes you to compare the two numbers. So painting A is 467. Painting B is 463. I'm going to give you two minutes to get a comparison and tell me which one is more and why. And your why needs to be blank and then use greater than or less than blank. Okay, off you go. Which one did you choose, A or B? Which one was greater? If you chose A, why? Okay, if you chose B, why? Okay, let's take a look at my work. Let's see what I did. I did 467 and I wrote it in expanded form. And I did it right on top of each other so I could really compare each place value. So A has 400, B has 400. A has 60, B has 60. A has seven, B has three. There's where they're different. So I'm gonna compare those place values. And I decided that seven was greater than three. So painting A has more votes because 467 is greater than 463. Let's take a look at some other ways to solve this problem. This was not the only way to solve this problem. Go ahead, Mr. Kevin, we can go just to the PowerPoint. So you could show it in a quick drawing and you could show, look, 467 has more just in the drawing, it has the same amount of hundreds, the same amount of tens and more ones because there's more of them. 
You could model it in a number chart. You could say, look, there's four hundreds in both, six tens in both, and then the ones, there's seven and three, and seven is greater than three, so 467 is greater. Or you could do what I did and write it in expanded form and use that. So now let's do some writing of what it would look like. So we need to compare. We already talked about we needed the ones place. So let's look at number two. We need to compare 467 and 463. And you need to write it both ways. Now, what does this mean right here? Take a look. If you read from left to right, do you have the two points or the one point first? You have the two points. It's the one that's greater. So we say blank is greater than blank. So what are we going to write there? Which number is greater? 467 is greater than 463. Did you write that on your whiteboard? Please do. Then I want you to do this one on your own. Go ahead and write it on your whiteboard. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds. Okay, you should have written 463 is less than 467. Why can we compare them two ways? Right, because one is greater and one is less. And we can say the sentence differently. We can start with the number that's greater or start with the number that's less. And both are correct. And so we know that 467 was greater than 463 and 463 is less than 467. So which one got the most votes? A. A got the most votes because it had the greater number. Okay, now let's look at these problems. And these problems are the reason teachers came up with the alligator eats the greater number, right? And that's great, but if you can't read what you wrote, then that's going to be an issue. So we're comparing, let's look at A. This is A right here. On your whiteboard, I would like you to write 264 and then a space and then 462. Go ahead and write that down. Now we start by looking at the hundreds place. Look at the first number, there's two hundreds. Look at the second number, there's four hundreds. They're different, we can, we can compare based on the hundreds. So it's two, two hundreds greater or less than four hundreds. Yeah, it's less. So we put one dot here because it's the less number. We put two dots here because it's the greater number and we connect it. And now we can read it. 264 is less than 462. Let's do B together. Go ahead and write this problem on your whiteboard. Which place value are we going to compare? The hundreds are the same. What about the tens, Rafa? Oh, they both have seven tens. That's the same. So we're going to need to look at the ones. Is two ones less than nine ones? Or is two ones greater than nine ones? Think about ones. If I have two and I have nine, is two less or greater than nine? It's less, there's not as many. So what symbol am I gonna write for less than? 372 is less than 379. Okay, let's look at C. Do this one all on your own. 954 and 950. Is 954 greater than 950 or less than 950? Nine hundred fifty four is greater. Excellent work.
Okay. 876, now this one I'm gonna draw. Do you know why I'm gonna draw this one? Because look, I use the same digits and I know when we use the same digits and numbers, our brain can get them mixed up really easily. So I'm gonna use that place value chart and I'm gonna just do it right here because it's nice and quick, right? So we can do hundreds, tens, and ones for two numbers. So we've got eight hundreds, seven tens, and six ones, eight hundreds, six tens, and seven ones. Okay, the hundreds place is the same. We can't compare that. What about the tens place? Yeah, it's different. Which one's greater? Seven tens is more than six tens, right? So this is our greater number. Now we look back up here. And which number came first? 876. Is that one greater or less? It's greater. Which symbol is greater? The one with two dots first. So I'm going to do it this way. That means is greater than. Let's read it and make sure it makes sense. 876 is greater than 867. It makes sense. E, you do it all on your own. You decide. What is the correct answer there? Seven hundred eighteen is less than seven hundred eighty-eight because one ten is less than eight tens. Last problem, F. Solve it and be able to tell why. Okay. 653 is greater than 553 because 600s is greater than 500s. Ta-da! We did it! Nice job, second graders. Now, last problem. Hope and Sarah are collecting pennies. Hope has 189 pennies. Sarah has 186 pennies. Which comparisons are correct? So we're going to go down the line and say if they're correct or not. Let's look at A. 189 is less than 186. Is that correct? No, because 9 is greater than 6. 186 is, what's that symbol mean? Less than 189. Is that correct? Yes, because 6 is less than 9. 189 is, gr what's that one? Greater than 186. Is this correct? Yep, it is. 186 is greater than 189? No. And 186 equals, what does equals mean? It's the same as. 186 is the same as 189. No. So our correct answers are B and C. Great job. Your assignment today is to continue practicing this. You're going to do page 357 and 358 in your math workbook. Today we learned to compare three-digit numbers. We're getting really good at it. Nice job. Don't forget that if you can't do the comparison in your head and you want to draw a picture, you can do it. You can use a quick drawing. You can use expanded form. You can use a um, place value table. Any of those things are great tools to help you compare numbers that are three digits. And we use those models to explain our thinking and tell why. Now, at the beginning, we were saying that you could maybe Think of a memory from when you were really little and maybe even back to when you were two. And you could write it down or draw it and send it to us here in the TV classroom. So Mr. Kevin, please tell them how they can do that. Memories are great to send via an email machine or it's also known as a computer. So you can type in TV classroom at Tacoma 
www.k12.wa.us. We'd love to see your memories uh, or pictures or anything else, right? TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405, if you want to mail us a letter. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Now, before you get going, you need to make sure to gather these materials for your time with Ms. Oslin. You'll need your ELA packet, your pencil, and your learning buddy. Have a great break, take care of your needs while you're on your break, and then be back and ready to learn when she is on the screen. Friends, I will see you tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. <laughs>
Hi, second graders. Welcome back from your break. I see that you have your new ELA packet. So we're starting a new unit today. Very exciting. Go ahead and put your packet and your pencil off to the side. You don't need that yet, but go ahead and keep your learning buddy in your lap if that helps you be a stronger learner. Today, we are learning fiction texts are created from the author's imagination and are not real. What that means is there's a whole genre, say genre. genre. Genre means it's a type of book. Fiction is a genre. There's a lot of fiction books. And these books are created from our author's imagination. They're not real, even though we'll find that they may seem real sometimes. So like I said, there's a lot of different types of fiction. And I wanna show you, this chart is in your new ELA packet, but don't worry about getting it out right now. I wanna show you that there are two boxes on this chart. The top box has traditional literature as some type of fiction. And then the bottom box has some other types of literature. Now, we're gonna think about traditional literature and then also think about fantasy, science fiction, realistic fiction, historical fiction, and mystery. Think about, have you ever heard any of those terms before? And if so, what do you know about them? Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy what you think you know about some of these types of fiction. Gus, I know that traditional literature has a lot of what we call a subgenre which is it has different types of literature within it. It's so like folk tales, fairy tales, tall tales, legends, fables, myths. And I know science fiction, Mr. Oslin likes to read science fiction. And I like to read uh, realistic fiction, which is fiction that seems like it could be real, but I know it's not because it's fiction. So it comes from our author's imagination. Um, and I like historical fiction, which is fiction 
stories that are not real but are based on true events in history. Mr. Kevin, what kind of books or fiction do you like to read? I love science fiction. What do you love about science fiction? Usually in science fiction, technology, it takes in the it, it takes place in the future, oh. right? And the technology that that we've developed in the future is just intriguing to me. I love the technology. Oh, that's exciting. So friends, think about what types of fiction you like to read. What do you already know about them? And you're gonna think about that as we read this whole unit for the next couple of months. I wanna point out that realistic fiction are make-believe stories that seem real. But there's also um, other types of fiction that we know that could not ever happen, like fantasy. We know that that could not happen. So think about these types of fiction as we look at some of the books that we're going to start reading this unit. This is called Super Completely and Totally the Messiest. It's by Judith Viorst, and the pictures are by Robin Price Glasser. And this is a example, an example, of a realistic fiction. Because looking at the front cover, I can see the character is a person that's pretty messy. That could be real. I have a human in my house who is often very messy, much like this character. That lets me know that this is realistic fiction. It seems real. It seems like it could really happen. But we know because it's fiction that it's not real. It comes from our author, Judith Viorst's imagination. Now, this is an example of a traditional literature. This is The Ugly Duckling. It's adapted and illustrated by Jerry Pinkney, but it originally comes from Hans Christian Andersen. Now, we have a chart, you have a chart, in your ELA packet, it's page five, and it's exploring fiction, and then it has three different columns where it's going to show us features of traditional literature, realistic fiction, in fantasy fiction. And we're gonna focus on the traditional literature when we're thinking about the ugly duckling. Traditional literature have stories from around the world. They're stories that are passed down from generation to generation. That means maybe I heard the story from my parents who heard it from their parents who heard it from their parents. Those are all different generations. So it's passed down. The story is told usually orally, which means out loud from our mouth, from a parent to a child or a grandparent to a child or a great grandparent to a child or maybe an aunt or an uncle to a child. And today, many of these stories are actually written down, like we saw in The Ugly Duckling. But the book we're gonna look at today is A Sick Day for Amos McGee. It's written by Philip C. Stead and illustrated by Aaron E. Stead. This book is an example of a fantasy fiction. And our chart tells us that fantasy fiction is a fanciful story that stretches the reader's imagination. It cannot possibly be real. And it has unrealistic characters like talking animals or settings like living on Mars, which maybe someday, but not today. We don't live on Mars today. So think about those elements. Fanciful story that stretches the reader's imagination cannot possibly be real and unrealistic characters or settings. Think about those today as we read A Sick Day for Amos McGee by Philip C. Stead. Now, take a look at the cover. And the, there's a picture of a man, and the man looks perfectly normal to me. And he's playing cards, but who's he playing cards with? An elephant and a penguin. Chili and Mabel. <gasps> Chili and Mabel! Hey, were you playing cards with Amos McGee? Mabel, does that seem 
realistic. Could a real elephant and a real penguin really play cards with someone? That is fantastic. That could not really happen. And before we read, I want to tell you that a sick day is when you stay home from school or work when you're not feeling well. Maybe you have an upset stomach or you have a fever or you're really sniffly. We call that a sick day. So think about a sick day for Amos McGee and think about the different types of literature or fiction and how this story came from our author's imagination. Amos McGee was an early riser. Every morning, when the alarm clock clanged, he swung his legs out of bed and swapped his pajamas for a fresh pressed uniform. He would wind his watch and set a pot of water to boil, saying to the sugar bowl, a spoonful for my oatmeal, please, and two for my teacup. Belly full and ready for the workday, he'd amble out the door. Every day, Amos waited for the number five bus. Next stop, City Zoo, the bus driver would call. 6 a.m., right on time, he'd reply. Amos had a lot to do at the zoo but he always made time to visit his good friends. He would play chess with the elephant who thought and thought before making a move, run races with the tortoise who never ever lost, sit quietly with the penguin who was very shy. Lend a handkerchief to the rhinoceros, who always had a runny nose. A handkerchief is like a cloth Kleenex or tissue that you can wash and reuse. So he would lend a handkerchief to the rhinoceros, who always had a runny nose. And at sunset, reads stories to the owl, who was afraid of the dark. Okay, so Amos, our main character, works at the city zoo. Looking at these illustrations, how do you think Amos feels about the animals? Take some think time. Turn and tell your learning buddy how you think Amos feels about the animals. Gus, I think he cares for the animals really, really deeply. They're his friends. He does things to take care of them and show that he loves them. How do you think Amos is feeling in this picture? Can you see his face there? He's smiling. He looks pretty content, which you'll remember is the feeling that Mrs. Wally has taught us about. He seems calm, happy to be there. We might say he's in his happy place. Now we know that a zookeeper doesn't really play chess with an elephant or read stories to the owls. The illustrator, illustrations help us know how Amos is feeling, but they also let us know that he's a caring person and that this story is a fantasy. It is not real and it could never be real. One day, Amos awoke with the sniffles and the sneezes and the chills. He swung his achy legs out of bed, curled them back again and said, "Ugh, I don't think I'm going to work today. Meanwhile, at the zoo, the animals waited for their friend the elephant arranged his pawns and polished his castles. The tortoise stretched his legs and limbered up. The penguin sat patiently all by himself. The rhinoceros worried that his allergies were worsening. The owl perched atop a tall stack of storybooks 
scratching his head with concern. Where is Amos? The animals wondered. Later that day, What do you think they're doing? Mr. Kevin, what do you think? I think they're coming to visit. You think? Yeah. Hooray! My good friends are here. Wow, Mr. Kevin, you are right. These illustrations show that the animals are doing what Amos does every day. They go through Amos's routine. Let's go back and look at the illustrations again. Later that day, so they're leaving the zoo, waiting at the bus stop, riding the number five bus back to Amos's house. There were no words on those pages. We relied on the illustrations to tell the story. The elephant prepared a game of chess. Amos thought and thought before making a move. I'm too tired to run races today, said Amos to the tortoise. Let's play hide and seek instead. The tortoise hid inside his shell. Amos hid beneath the covers. Amos yawned. I could use a nap. The penguin sat quietly, keeping Amos's feet warm. Achoo! Amos awoke with a sneeze. The rhinoceros was ready with a handkerchief. I'm beginning to feel much better. Thank you, said Amos to his friends. He swung his legs out of bed. Perhaps we'll share a pot of tea. Amos wound his alarm clock. It's getting late, he said. After all, we have a morning bus to catch. So Amos said good night to the elephant and good night to the tortoise and good night to the penguin and good night to the rhinoceros and good night to the owl who, knowing that Amos was afraid of the dark, read a story aloud before turning out the light. Now, I noticed that this story is sort of divided into two parts. In the first half, we meet Amos and we meet the animals and we see his daily routine and ritual of having his oatmeal, having his cup of tea, riding the bus to the zoo, greeting all of his friends. He's caring for those animals. And in the second half, we see that the animals go to Amos's house and take care of him. They go through his routine of riding the bus and then they take care of him in the same way that Amos usually takes care of them. His kindness has been returned. The main character Amos seems like a very real ordinary man on his way to work. He actually reminds me a lot of my dad. My dad likes to get up early in the morning. He has a routine. He likes to have a cup of tea in the morning and every morning he eats a banana. So this character, Amos, reminded me a lot of my dad. Seems very real to me. But his friends, the elephant, the tortoise, the rhinoceros, the owl, and the penguin couldn't really ride a bus through the city or take care of Amos. These fantastic details are what makes this story fantasy fiction. It's what makes it so that we know that this could not really happen. We're gonna explore other types of fiction during this really awesome fiction unit. We're gonna take a look at realistic fiction. We're gonna look at fantasy fiction like this story. And we're going to learn about some traditional literature. Now, during your independent reading today, I want you to find some fiction texts 
so that you can read to yourself. And I want you to use this chart to help you decide, are your texts traditional literature? Are they realistic fiction? Or are they like A Sick Day for Amos McGee and they're fantasy fiction? Use these bullet points on this chart to help you decide. And then in your reading notebook, I want you to write about which style of fiction you enjoy reading and why. And Mr. Kevin gave a great example at the beginning of our lesson of which type of fiction he enjoys and why he enjoys it. So that's your independent writing today. Today we are learning that fiction texts are created from the author's imagination and are not real, even if they seem real. Now, I would like you to send us your writing and tell us about what's your favorite type of fiction writing and why. And Mr. Kevin is going to tell you how you can send that to us here at our TV classroom. Of course I will. Students, you can email us at tvclassroom at tacoma.ku. 12.wa.us, or you can send it in mail with an envelope and a stamp, and that would be TV Classroom 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington 98405. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. Second graders, we look forward to getting your writing. And you know what would be fun is if you and I like the same kind of fiction, we can write back and forth and recommend books to each other. Wouldn't that be exciting? So please do send us your writing. Now it's time for our affirmation. And I have to tell you, it was a bit of a rough morning here in TV Classroom. We were making some mistakes. We got rather silly. We had a lot of fun. So I think our affirmation today that we're going to remind ourselves is I can do all the things. All the things that need to get done, I can do them. So say that to yourself. I can do all the things. I can do all the things. You can do all the things. And then go do all the things. Excellent job today thinking and reading with me today, second graders. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Remember, tomorrow is Wednesday, which means we have our special guest and art with Miss Teresa. So thanks so much for being here with me today. I will see you back here tomorrow in our TV classroom. Bye. Hey kids, we want to see your work. Just send your pictures and your stories to TV Classroom, 601 South 8th Street, Tacoma, Washington, 98405.